versus mortality among patients. And so this is the kind of thing that the Comparative Effectiveness Research Center is set up to really look at, to fund that kind of research. Because quite honestly, the reason so many practitioners were using that device, and this is an issue across medical care, the reason practitioners were using that device is frankly the device manufacturers sold it to them. And that's true with drugs. Uh, the biggest salespeople are those who are promoting these products. There is not that great independent information across a broad range of services for clinicians to make decisions about what works. That's what this PCORI was set up to do. It is now being characterized as a death panel because it is going to make recommendations on what works and what doesn't work. And for the things that don't work, even though it says it can't make reimbursement decisions, for the things that don't work, it's going to recommend that those things not be done. And so, you know, just like uh, during the health reform law, it was really discussion, those town hall meetings where people talked about death panels were so tragic because honestly, what, what that was all about was giving patients at end of life more information about their options. And I don't know how many of you have dealt with patients at the end of their life or families, but I can tell you that every patient and family wants that information and practitioners want to be able to give it and that's what would have been funded and it got left out of the bill because of all of this myth about death panels. And that death panel issue is now moving over to comparative effectiveness research. We need research. We need data. We shouldn't be making decisions based upon who's selling a particular product. And so that is something that I think is very important for consumers to understand, for all of you in this room to understand, because you'll hear things mischaracterized. And again, there are many myths about this law. And it's very important, I think, incumbent on all of us to demystify and really counter those myths. So that's what that comparative effectiveness is. There's an expansion of federally qualified health centers. And again, very important. Uh, federally qualified health centers get $11 billion uh, over five years uh, in the law. And uh, Michigan is a state, and you can see this in the data we just released, Michigan is a state who has relatively few uh, federally qualified health centers compared to most other states. And in fact, we did a little overlay of who is on the Appropriations Committee in Congress and the states that have the highest number of federally qualified health centers. And there did seem to be an association between the two. Um, we might do a study along those lines. Um, but we know that we have had less funding than we should have. And in fact, there is a group, the Michigan Primary Care Association is working with a group in Southeast Michigan who went to Congress a couple weeks ago, talked to our delegation and said it's time that we got more of our share and there's $11 billion in the law and we want some of it to come to our very distressed state. And so again, that's very important for coalitions like that to be going to Washington, to be taking advantage of the funding uh, that is in the law. The depression center network I put on here because this is an area that is authorized but not appropriated. Uh, there's a billion dollars in funding described that would fund up to 20, uh, 20 depression centers initially expanding to 30 over time um, with a coordinating center. Senator Stabenow is the one who actually got this piece in the legislation. Uh, it is not appropriated. And so there's a network of depression centers that's formed. They actually have hired their own lobbyists. They are in Washington trying to get funding. And that's the kind of thing that I think is illustrative of what needs to happen. Groups who care about these things, and there's so much that I, in the law that I don't have time to go over today, but groups who care about these things, and you can really see most of it in our policy brief, need to go through that policy brief and see what is it they want to make sure actually happens and coalesce and tell our congressional delegation and do what we can to get the funding to come to Michigan. Uh, I told you earlier, training and workforce development, there's a lot of this described. This is great. More primary care education, more advanced practice education. None of this is funded. All described, all authorized, none of it is appropriate. So if you care about educating more practitioners, about expanding access, uh, this would be a great thing to work on. Okay, let me, let me transition, um, and I'll do this quickly so we have time for questions to give you a sense of what we think the impact is going to be in Michigan. And uh, there are a couple of these I'm going to focus on and go through some of the others more quickly. The report that we just released uh, that is very comprehensive picture of health coverage in Michigan looked at health coverage um, for 2007-2008. That's the most uh, 
recently available comprehensive data uh, that is out there on the picture of health coverage in our state. And you can see here uh, that we have about uh, just under 11 percent of the state's population who are uninsured, about a million people uh, in our state uh, who are uninsured. And, and again, this data is uh, in this issue brief here. And you can see it'll maybe a little bit more clearly even then on the screen. Um, we did some projections of what would happen uh, after health care reform. And I, and I want to caveat these projections. Every projection you hear on health care reform, and lots of people are out there making projections, every projection you hear on health care reform relies on a series of assumptions because nobody knows. Um, now, some people, like the Urban Institute and others, have looked at what happened in Massachusetts and say, okay, if we, if we sort of follow that model, here's what could happen. Uh, and I'll give you uh, some examples of their numbers. Other people have, Kaiser's done sort of their own modeling and come up with their own assumptions, et cetera. Uh, nobody knows what's really going to happen. So what we did was to say, okay, if everybody who is eligible after health reform did follow through, got enrolled in Medicaid, well, you know, did follow through on the mandate, the individual mandate to get coverage, and we can talk about the mandate issue a little bit later. Um, if they did that, what would it look like in Michigan? So this is the maximum picture here. So, you know, we think we, we go from, uh, from about a, a million people who are uninsured to about 150,000 people who are uninsured post-health reform. And most of those who would be uninsured post-health reform are undocumented immigrants. Uh, you might remember there was also a lot of debate about immigrants uh, during the health reform discussion. And everybody stood up there and pointed to, in fact, I think uh, uh, maybe it was Gary Peters who did a town hall uh, in southeast Michigan and he got challenged in the town hall about, oh, you're covering all these illegal immigrants. And he put on the screen the actual language of the bill that says they would not be covered. Uh, and was told he was a liar. So, but they're not covered. <laughs> and so they are about 140,000 people in our state. Obviously, it's a much bigger population in many other states um, than it is here. And so that would drop us to about 1.5% of the state who would be uninsured. Uh, and both the private sector and the public sector uh, increase in the percentages of coverage. Um, we have a couple of pies here where we don't know where some people would go because there are people today who buy individual private health coverage who would become eligible for Medicaid in the future. We don't know if they'll stick with private coverage or go to Medicaid. And we have some folks who work in small businesses uh, who would become eligible for Medicaid um, in the future. And we're not sure where they'll go. It'll be very dependent on what the regulations are that require states to maintain effort uh, what they look like. So we sort of put those as pies, but if they all ended up in the private sector, about 64 percent of the state's population uh, would have private coverage. And so you can see we both grow pretty significantly on the Medicaid side uh, and we grow uh, significantly on the private sector side. Um, I want to talk a minute about this one pie here uh, because I think it's really important and it's the 16 percent. <coughs> of the population. You might have heard numbers that say the Medicaid will grow up to 500,000 people. Our numbers are a little smaller than that. We say about 400,000. It's, it's important to understand there are two parts in that assumption. One group are the newly eligible. That's about, in our numbers, 286,000 people who become newly eligible for Medicaid because of that expansion to 133 percent of poverty. And the other group are people who are already eligible for Medicaid but not enrolled, and everybody is assuming after health reform they'll get enrolled. Now that assumption relies on two things. It relies on an expectation the states will do much more outreach to get people enrolled than they do today, which, and there, there is some money behind that in the federal law. Uh, and it also relies on the assumption that because there's health reform, people are really going to be paying attention uh, and they'll get into the process. Uh, it will be very, this whole idea of outreach, of eligibility, of how we as a state get people enrolled is fundamental. And I, for those people who care about expanding coverage in our state, I would strongly encourage you to pay attention to this issue of outreach and enrollment. And I'm going to give you one number that's not on these slides, but it's very illustrative and my Medicaid friends can probably comment on this in more detail. Um, we looked at the My Child program and it's in our full report. In 2005, we had 55,000 children enrolled in the My Child program. 
Today it's about 44,000. And in 2005,